views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello and welcome to this very special edition of Open World, the only show where we bring cultures from around the world right to our BronxNet studios. Today's guest is an award-winning pianist whose music has filled numerous prestigious concert halls such as Carnegie Hall, Merkin Concert Hall, and Steinway Hall. Today, she'll join us to tell us about her upcoming recital, as well as give us a taste of her signature sound. So sit down, relax, and get ready for this edition of Open World right now. And hello, I'm Darren Jaime, and you're watching Open World right here on BronxNet. We want to remind you to stay connected to us, and you can stay with us on social media. Tweet us at, at BronxNet TV, or you can like us at Facebook at BronxNet Community Television, or visit us anytime on the web at www.bronxnet.tv. Now, today's guest is a musical talent that made her first orchestral debut at the age of 14. By the age of 23, she made her first debut at Carnegie Hall, and since then, the pianist has continued to use her gift to give back to people all over the world. Joining us now to tell us more of her story, we welcome now Karine Pogosion, and thank you for getting to be with us. Thank you so much. We are excited to have you, and it's actually an exciting time for you, and uh, in a little while, you'll be getting ready to go to Carnegie Hall and have your own first real solo performance, mm -hmm. and uh, talk to us about that, Carnegie Hall. Very excited. October 19, uh, I'm presenting a really special program titled Transformations. And it's actually my fifth uh, return mm -hmm. to Carnegie Hall, but this is a really, really special one. I feel this is my first fully professional solo uh, appearance uh, back in this legendary hall. And uh, the pieces I chose are all very, very special to me. So mm -hmm. very excited. Can't and you wait. say tra they're transformations in your own way. But to be honest, you got transformations based on personal experience. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I had an extremely uh, big year last year, a lot of events in my life, a lot of changes. And mm -hmm. I really felt like I'm coming into my own as an artist, as a human being. Uh, as a young lady mm -hmm. and I, I felt a, a major transformation take place in me where I felt um, much, much more prepared to take on bigger stages, bigger challenges and uh, just come into my own as mm -hmm. an artist. And so I chose this specific program uh, with four pieces that, uh, or four of them are examples of transformation and it kind of uh, connected to that theme. Uh, very, very exciting program with uh, Beethoven Symphony mm -hmm. that originally is for a symphony orchestra, but then we have uh, the most incredible piano transcription by Franz Liszt, a uh, legendary pianist himself, mm -hmm. uh, in whose hands it became a piano masterpiece and mm -hmm. fully just as valid a, a composition as uh, its original version for orchestra. and. Uh, Mm, so you're taking that. something that normally would be with an orchestra, taking it to piano, and obviously, do you feel a pressure about this do, about this here? <laughs> yeah. it, I definitely feel pressure, but I also feel a great excitement because I, uh, as an artist, it's one of my biggest passions to try and showcase um, unique um, sides of each piece to listeners that they may not have necessarily you know, known before, they may not have been familiar with before. As soon as you say Beethoven Fifth Symphony, immediately in everyone's minds is the full orchestra. And when you tell them that there is a, a piano transcription, there is a bit of skepticism. Mm -hmm. Like, is that, how is that going to sound? And so that is a, definitely a little bit of a pressure cooker, but I also am excited. I'm yeah. excited to show them that it's just as valid, just as beautiful on the piano. And Brahms is in there too. I have uh, a piece by Johannes Brahms, uh, which is inspired by Niccolo Paganini's uh, violin variations, uh, violin caprice, and it's an extraordinary composition where he took that uh, original simple tune that uh, was written by Paganini, and he created this very complex, multi-layered, again, piano uh, masterpiece, mm -hmm. just perfectly uh, valid on, on the piano. So, also beautiful work. And when we speak of 
transformation. There's a ballet that you're also transforming as well. I have two works also on the program that originally were ballets. I have the Adagio uh, from Adam Kachatrian's Spartacus, uh, which is a piano transcription of specifically of the segment in the ballet that is this beautiful love duet. Um, and the two main characters are on the stage dancing. And in the hands of Matthew Cameron, an incredible American pianist, uh, that specific moment in the ballet became just the most beautiful piano masterpiece. Uh, so I cannot wait to share that. And the last, uh, the grand finale of the evening is Stravinsky's Firebird. Mm -hmm. Uh, transcribed uh, also for solo piano by Guido Agosti. So, so when you picked out these pieces, what what was your mindset in saying this is what I want to do? This would fit what I what, what I want to do. I confess it was a very <laughs> grueling process because I went through five, six, seven different versions, and uh, the common thread I feel that works with all four of the big works in this program is a certain sense of optimism and a uh, transformation in that regard as well, mm -hmm. where you start in a dark place, you start in uh, a place of questioning, and then you arrive at a self-actualized, confident, uh, you know, climactic point. And all four works have that, and they really have that very positive, uplifting, uh, life-affirming force uh, to them. And so it's going to be, I hope, a very inspiring uh, experience for all the listeners. And what are you hoping the listeners actually take away from this? I mean, they'll be coming and there'll be great expectation. And I know you feel great pressure, but, <laughs> but what do you want them to be able to take away? I want to be able to inspire each and every listener to uh, go ahead boldly and experience their own transformation, take on their biggest, biggest projects that they are afraid to tackle, perhaps, but uh, they get a little bit of extra courage and inspiration to uh, go ahead and, and go for it and realize that they have the power to do that, to have that caterpillar to butterfly uh, transformation themselves. Is that what you're feeling right now? I think so. I mm -hmm. think so, definitely. Yeah, well, I, I think people would be excited to really hear and you know, have the opportunity to hear you perform and, and take this and put this in such a major way. I mean, obviously, a lot of work has gone into it. I want to, in the next segment, talk a little bit after we hear from you. But I want to talk about the preparation because uh, there's a lot of preparation for something as major as this. But you've also been this summer in Vienna mm -hmm. and you're doing some work out there in Vienna. Share with us. I, yeah, it was a really exciting summer. I performed in El Barsal, the most legendary uh, hole there that actually Brahms himself had performed uh, over a hundred years ago. And uh, Vienna is, is really a city of music. It's, it's such an inspiring place to just be in. So I got to perform two recitals there and I also taught in a summer academy uh, that you know had students from all over the world, from Japan, from Latin America. Some of the most incredible young people had gathered there uh, and I had the chance to coach them. So it was a very inspiring summer, definitely. We'll be right back right after this. And we are back here on Open World, and as promised, Karine is getting ready to give us an excerpt from Brahms. And we're going to that right now.
back to Overworld. We are here with Armenian pianist Karine Pogacion, who is here telling us about her upcoming solo recital. And uh, it's taking place at Carnegie Hall. And uh, so give me a little bit about this, the preparation. Mm -hmm. Because when you have something as big as Carnegie Hall, for me, I play basketball, Madison Square Garden. That would be the big thing, right? <laughs> so for you, going to Carnegie Hall, as you said, a lot of pressure, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. But how do you work in rehearsal and being able to prepare for such a, that, such a thing as this, especially coming out of Vienna and doing the things that you're doing? What's the preparation like in the, in the rehearsals? Most of my life, I've had the um, habit of journaling. Mm. And every day, I write down my to-do list, my specific schedule. Um, especially if it's a little bit more of a flexible day, I like to create a timetable. Otherwise, mm. it's very easy to just take your time and relax. So I have to be very, very organized and uh, create a plan of what I want to accomplish for that day and um, uh, put away the phone. Right. Very, very important rule. Yes. Uh, no phone near the piano so that I don't no have any... phone, <laughs> no social media. <laughs> no distractions. No, right, no distractions. <laughs> Notifications, none yeah, of that. Yeah, <laughs> can't, have, can't have any of that. No. So how many hours would you say do you spend really practicing and rehearsing? It's a, it, it varies day to day. On average, three to four is my average, but I have had you know, I've had emergency situations when I had to, let's say, substitute someone last minute and I had to really cram, mm -hmm. put in 10, 11 hours just to get ready. So, but on average, I don't go over four hours. I don't want to do, it's one of those where you don't want to do too much. You right. want to leave uh, a little bit of freshness to, uh, to your approach and not, not cram too, too much. What do you want people to take away from your music? Hmm. Um, I, I consider it the mission of my life to inspire. I really want to give energy. I want to give uh, inspiration. And I've had, I'm, I'm very blessed I've had that happen in concerts when I have had audience members approach me and say that they had just had an incredibly uh, sad event in their life happen or, you know, they, they were not in a good place. And after the performance, they feel completely rejuvenated. And you can just see it from their smile. They're just beaming and full of energy. And I want to be that force. I want to bring that to people with my playing. Mm -hmm. And what advice do you give to somebody who's watching and saying, listen, you know, you're an accomplished solo pianist. What does it take? What should they know? A lot of hard work. <laughs> and uh, the most, most important thing is faith in yourself. Mm -hmm. Because especially in the earlier stages, uh, one would hope you have good coaches, good teachers, and, and sources of uh, encouragement, but it's not always the case. And there may be people even lovingly telling you not to even bother, or it's gonna, it's gonna be too hard, don't, don't do that. So you have to, if you really want to do it, you have to have huge faith in your own mission. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, be able to shut off the, that uh, noise from the outside and, and just work, work hard. Walk me through a little bit about the people who've inspired you to get to you to where you are today and how much of that comes through in your music? I am incredibly blessed. I have, both of my parents are very artistic uh, and uh, from a very young age they told me to go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, they are my biggest supporters and most terrifying critics. Mm -hmm. They're very severe when they're going to tell you stuff. They're going to tell right, you. Right, <laughs> right. It was great. No, you got this right. <laughs> they're very real, and uh, so I, I'm very blessed that I've always had that uh, wonderful support system to fall back on at home. Mm -hmm. And I've had incredible, incredible teachers uh, back in Armenia, in uh, California, and also in Manhattan School of Music. We have just the most inspiring atmosphere in that school. So it was incredible to attend that school uh, myself. Is there a difference between school in Armenia and school here in the U.S.? Um, you know, ultimately, it all comes down to talented people who work really hard. So it's, uh, it's the same wherever you go in Armenia and Vienna. Uh, you have incredibly vulnerable young people that adore music, but they're not quite yet confident. And so the mission of all schools, I think, is to teach them the basics, teach them the, uh, you know, how to play a phrase properly. But ultimately, our goal is to encourage and inspire to have them believe themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, at the start, I told people that you'll be playing at Carnegie Hall on October the 19th. And okay. then, you know, you've also played at Merkin and mm -hmm. you've played at Steinway. Is there a difference between the three? Talk to me about the differences between those 
there is nothing like Carnegie Hall. It just, uh, I've played in so many different halls, but there is an absolute unique magic to, to that space. It's, uh, it's, it's filled with so many spirits from the legends in the past, and uh, it's glorious acoustics, and uh, it's, a, it's a thrill. Does it overtake you just being in the Carnegie Hall itself? Well? It's, <laughs> it's, it's number one place in the world for mm -hmm. a musician to be in. So talk to us a little bit about Steinway Hall. Mm -hmm. Well, Steinway actually went through an interesting transformation itself. It used to be right by Carnegie Hall, and now they change addresses. And it has become a really modernized uh, venue now. It's a very interesting uh, venue to go and perform in. We were continuing our conversation with Katane, and she's sharing with us a little bit about her upcoming recital, and it's going to be taking place at Carnegie Hall Thursday, October the 19th at 7.30 p.m. And uh, as the days get closer, uh, the excitement continues to loom. But in addition to this being a recital, this is also for you a collaboration. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I really wanted to go beyond just performing a concert in a traditional sense. So I approached two uh, UN women's organizations uh, and I wanted to make sure that uh, we have some sort of a social consciousness towards, uh, you know, connected to this, this project. So a, a portion of the proceeds is going to go to girls' education and empowerment uh, funds and projects. So yeah, I'm very, very excited about that that aspect definitely and being able to give back in such a in such a powerful way given the fact of the days and the times and when we talk about the things that are going on whether it's you know Las Vegas or Puerto Rico or right. Texas or these earthquakes that we're hearing around the world music plays a very important a, a very important piece talk to us about how music is almost a buffer for a lot of people uh, from the ills of society it really is. I confess uh, Las Vegas hit me very hard as a musician. It is incredibly heartbreaking to see a musical event become a scene of such a tragedy because music, as exactly as you said, is a place of not just escape but again a transformation. It's a place you go and rejuvenate yourself and your energy and so I, uh, I agree. I think the absolute uh, best we can do as musicians is continue our mission and continue to work even harder to, to bring this joy and this love that music brings uh, to people and hopefully inspire the world to be a little bit more loving. Mm -hmm. What would you say to people who, you know, when we talk about music and the arts, we talk about education, sometimes in our educational institutions, music, arts, they're the first line of budget cuts. But <sighs> For you, it's become a career, a lifestyle. As for many other people, what would you say to people who, who really think about music and the arts as a, as a, as a second hand? Mm, I, I'm heartbroken to see that happen every time I hear news of that taking place. I believe with my whole heart that arts uh, and arts education is, is just as important as science, as math. I think you develop, first thing that you develop is an ability to listen. And I cannot emphasize, I think in this world, especially everything happening around us, I think we need to learn how to listen and to learn how to communicate. When you play chamber music, when you play a string quartet, it's all about four people working together and communicating. And so um, I really hope that uh, both our government and the world uh, around us will begin to appreciate music more. I'll do my, my part mm -hmm. as much as I can. So what's gonna make Carnegie Hall so unique? It is, I think, a concert, but at the same time, it's much more than a concert. It is uh, about the, the power of music to transform, and it's about, again, all these incredible masterpieces that are well known to uh, not even just, just classical fans, but uh, people all around the world. But I think, uh, I think it ultimately comes down to the power of transformation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want you to stay with us here on Open World because guess what? Coming up after the break, Karina is going to take to the piano and she's going to give us her performance in just a few seconds. So stay with us right here on Open World. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, of course, you can check us out on the web at www.bronxnet.org. I want to thank our partners, the Lehman College Multimedia Center, for working with our BronxNet team in making this happen today. And listen, 
If you want tickets for the upcoming show, all you got to do is go to carnegiehall.org and you can get tickets to check out Katane as she performs and does wonderful things at Carnegie Hall. We're all rooting her on and we're happy to have her here on this very special edition of Open World. I'm Darren Hyman. Until the next time we meet, take care and God bless.